Uh, my name is Boris. I work on Build2. It's a next generation build tool chain for C++. Um, part of the tool chain is a build system. It's currently one of the few build systems that support C++ modules. So my talk is about modules. Most of you have probably been to Gabby's talk. My talk has a little bit more of a practical uh, spin to it. So it has three parts. Uh, the first part is what I call what and why, what are modules, why we need them. The second part is how we will see, look at some practical guidelines uh, of how applying modules to our code bases. And we'll finish with a when section which tries to answer the question when we can actually start migrating to modules. Okay, so if modules are a solution, what is the problem? So in this, here we're gonna try to arrive well, we first understand what the problem, and we'll try to arrive at the basic idea behind the solution. So how do we modularize our uh, code bases these days? And I use the broader sense of modularize. We use headers, right? We, we don't, in fact, it's so ingrained in us that we don't often even think about it, right? It's kind of part of our um, intuition. So if we have two translation units, two source files, and one translation unit needs something from another, we create a header, and the translation unit that wants to consume another one just includes that header. And again, we don't often even think what happens underneath. Uh, and what happens underneath is whenever a compiler sees an include directive for a header, it essentially copies and pastes that header the contents of that header as if you know you basically did in your edit and copied and pasted it. And it has a number of drawbacks, well quite a long list actually of drawbacks. Uh, first of all, compilation speed, right? If we have the compiler, if we use the same header in multiple translation units, compiler has to reparse, reprocess, re do the same thing over and over again. We have a header and source file split, right? We have to maintain consistent declarations in multiple pro, uh, places. We have, to, we have to repeat ourselves. We have lack of isolation. And this is actually a class of problems. Um, well, first of all, our code can change uh, the interface provided by the header. We can define a macro, or we can accidentally or intentionally inject an overload uh, into header's interface. Uh, headers can return the favor, right? They can change our code without, without us expecting them to do so. Again similar mechanisms, macros, or declarations that we didn't expect the header to define. Headers can also change each other, right, we, via the similar mechanisms, and that depends on which order you include the headers. We also have dependency on the implementation, which I think is also part of the isolation problem. In a nutshell, a header has to, if a, a, an interface of a header, if it needs some implementation defined de details, those implementation details have to be part of the header. And I'm sure most of you have used techniques to avoid uh, users of your header accidentally depending on implementation details, right? We have namespaces such as impl or details, or we use ugly declarations of our names and so on. In fact, this uh, mechanism actually sometimes, uh, oftentimes you end up with, with problems because of unintended consequences, but Sometimes we actually take advantage of them. Best example is probably the assert header where we use a macro to control what we get. And yeah, this is an example where you know, maybe you define and debug and change the expectation of a header where you, which you included or a header might have included the assert header as part of its implementation. And now all your users of the assert identifier have been replaced with something you didn't expect. Then we have ODR violations and ODR is actually a funny topic. The more you look into it, kind of the deeper the rabbit hole gets. I think it would be actually a great talk for CVPCon, so if anyone looking for a subject to, um, to just to, to present you know, ODR demystified. So um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but ODR has two parts. Um, so ODR stands for one definition rule, and there are two actually parts to it. There's a single definition rule which states that a non-inline function or variable, we, we should have a, a single de definition of, of a non-inline function or variable in the entire program. So this is the single definition part of ODR. And then we have the identical de definition rule which states that an, an inline function or variable, classes, templates, and so on, they have to have identical definitions in each translation unit. 
And headers allow us to violate easily both of them. Uh, next problem with headers, uh, order dependency and cycles. Again, the order in which we include headers uh, matter or may matter, depending on the implementation. Uh, we, headers also allow us to make uh, cycles between headers. Sometimes we actually take advantage of it, but I'm sure most of you have been uh, beaten by that. I personally have uh, multiple times. The other point about headers, and, and this is something that uh, those of us who work exclusively in C++ also often don't think consciously, is that headers make it really difficult from other languages to interface with C++. Right? If, if I say want to call something in C or C++, from Rust or Go, and the interface is a header, I, I, the, the, the language has to understand the full C++ or C, which is, as we all know, not a very practical thing. Okay, so this is the long list. In fact, if you look at it, you might wonder how come we survived for so long, but um, headers actually have their advantages, right? Um, so first of all, they're embarrassingly parallel. Right? The compiler can process, or a build system, or a machine can process as many includes as you throw at it. There's no single choke point, unless you use auto-generate headers, for example. Headers are also familiar, right? We've been using them for decades. We have developed, we have delivered uh, massive software that uses headers. So we, we kind of know where landmines are. Sometimes we step on them, but most of the time we are able to avoid them. Headers are also hackable and flexible, right? So some of those isolation problems are also the mechanisms that we can use, you know, if we are painted in a corner. Uh, for example, there is a third party header that does something bad. In our specific situation, we can maybe define a macro that changes the headers interface. So I'm sure some of you have used those techniques I personally have. Um, headers are also toolable, right? The build systems, IDs, static analyzers, they all uh, these days, more or less, are able to handle headers more or less reliably. And I put to a degree there because if you start pushing things a little bit further, for, for example, again, auto-generated headers, then things are a little bit beca becoming a little bit shaky. Okay, so this is the problem in a nutshell. And I think this, this list clearly shows that headers are not going anywhere uh, anytime soon, right? We, will, we, we, we are looking at the, at the world where we will have modules and headers together for quite a bit. And you will see that in C++20, there's actually a realization of that and there's some support for, for leaving in, in header module uh, combined world. Okay, so uh, let's not try to arrive at the basic idea behind modules, right? So this is the, our diagram of include, of textual include, of copy and paste. And the red part is, is the bad part, right? We have a separate, we have to have a separate file where we have to repeat ourselves and we have this copy and paste part. So what do we, if we just throw away the, the bad part, right? And just, you know, get, get names from one translation unit and another. So that's the basic idea about impartation, uh, about module impartation. Now, you've noticed I've changed the extension in the, in the file, right? We, we cannot just throw away the header and continue using or import the translation unit as is. There's actually quite a bit of changes that we'll have to make, and for good reasons, and most of them to, to solve and fix those issues that I've listed with headers. So it's actually something different. It's not just, you know, chuck away the header and go ahead. Okay, so, and that, that's, that's actually um, an important point. Uh, migration to modules is not gonna be free. There's quite a lot of changes you will have to do, and sometimes you might not be able to do it for various reasons lack of resources or you might have, uh, it might be a third party library that you cannot even change. Can't we get a partial solution? Can't we get rid of some of the bad things without actually modifying the headers or modifying our module from headers to proper C++ modules? Well, that's the basic idea behind header impartation, right? In C++20, uh, thanks to the module support, part of the module uh, mechanics is the ability to import a header as if it was a module. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, so, so in this case, we only need to modify the consumer, right? Only my consumer needs to change. We'll talk about it, exactly what that change 
involves. What if we cannot, um, what if we cannot change the consumer either, right? Well, if we cannot change the consumer, then there is include translation. So this is uh, another mechanism offered by C++ 20 modules. It allows us to translate include directives to hear the importations without actually modifying our source code. So these are the three uh, levels or options of modularization that are in C++ 20. So we have module importation, pro modules proper, we, header, we have header importation, and we have include translation to header importation. So we'll look into each of them in a little bit more detail. Uh, but before we do that, let's talk about briefly about build mechanics, what actually happens underneath, right? We, we, we more or less understand what happens with headers when, we, when, we, when the compiler sees uh, an include directive. Uh, it, it's good to get the same understanding for modules. When, when the compiler sees an import a declaration, when it says you, 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 you want to import a module or header unit, um, it actually doesn't go and read the source file. If it did, we kind of get the same um, to the same uh, old story of you know, copy and paste or redoing the same work all the time. So what happens in reality, at least in all major implementa main implementations today, is that the module is compiled to what is called a binary module interface, or BMI. And then whenever a translation unit actually imports a module, when you compile a translation unit that imports a module, instead of reading the module source code, the, the compiler reads this BMI. And uh, remember I mentioned that headers are embarrassingly par parallel. Well, modules are not so. There's a single, um, there's, there's, some, there's a choke point, there's something that we need to wait on before we can go and compile our translation in case it imports a module, which is the, this BMI file. Okay, so this is the basic idea behind uh, build mechanics. If you're interested to learn more, there's Michael's talk. I think it's tomorrow. Or in one of those days, uh, I'm sure you will go into quite a bit more detail later. Um, so yeah, I think I'll take questions at the end if possible. Okay, thanks. Okay, so again here, our modularization options. So we'll go quickly over each of them just to see what's going on. We'll start with the easiest to apply, right? Include translation. Uh, as I mentioned, no modifications required, neither in the consumer nor in the producer. Uh, but here there has to be importable. So that's an, a central uh, concept in, in, in supporting header importation in C++20. We'll talk about it in a bit. Um, the good news or important news is that all C++20 standard library headers, except for uh, the C wrapper headers, will be importable. So I think this is uh, a big deal, in my opinion. How does it actually work? Right? We, we don't actually have to uh, change in the, neither consumer, uh, not, the, not the module itself, where is the magic? Well, the magic will most likely be in the build system. Um, and just to give you a sense, I'm gonna show you what it looks like for build two. So I have a little um, example. So it's a synthetic benchmark. So the other goal here is to give you a sense of what kind of speed up you're looking for. Um, if, you, if you switch to something to include translation, for example, which is essentially free. So I have 100 translation units. Um, they all look like that. So they include iStream and uh, use it. Uh, and if you're not aware, iStream is a fairly heavy header. It includes a lot of things, it defines quite a lot of things. Um, so it's a good benchmark for something that is expensive to include. Uh, okay, so first we're gonna build it with, so the first build that, that is default configuration is is going to use the includes, you know, copy and paste, textual included, and so on. So let's see how long does that take. So about six seconds. I just rerun it quickly so that we get, you know, everything is warmed up. Okay, so it stays roughly at about six seconds. So now I'm going to reconfigure. Uh, this uh, project to use include translation. So as I said, the mechanism will be most likely in build system specific, some kind of switch or uh, configuration. So one of the ways to do it in build two, the simplest way, you just tell the build system which headers you want translated, right? Not very scalable, but uh, good one for examples. So 
gonna clean everything and build again. So now we are, we are doing include translation. So now the size team include is actually gonna be converted to a header importation. Okay, so about two, two, two seconds. So this is a six core uh, laptop. So we get about six um, seconds for header importation and uh, two seconds for uh, include translation. There you can see where the IS stream is actually compiled. Right. So the first thing we have to do, we have to produce the BMI for the IS stream. And you can see this is, this benchmark is using GCC, right? Okay, so um, this is kind of give you a sense of you know, what it could look, your build system might do it differently. Uh, also, let me mention this is the, all, all the compile, and I'm gonna talk about that in, at the end, but all the compiler implementations are still very experimental. There were absolutely no optimization done to, for build speed. So I think three times uh, speed up is probably the lower bound that we can expect. Also, um, if, if you talk to Google uh, folks uh, who have been using their own flavor of modules, which I think is pretty similar to include translation, the, the, the number, the three times number comes up quite a lot. Okay, um, let's briefly talk about uh, those importable headers, right? What does it actually mean? Well, intuitively it means that the header needs to be modular uh, in a broader sense, right? It, it should be, it should, you should be able to compile it as a, some sort of a translation unit independently, right? Think of you created a, a, a source file, just include a single file and you are able to, to compile it. So specifically, it, it, it cannot rely on any predefinitions, right? cannot rely on here, on, on uh, some macros being predefined or um, having some additional declarations. Like a good example of a header that is not modular and probably won't be importable is a header that expects you to pre-include some other header before it. Some code bases that do that. Um, so this is in a nutshell. And the standard goes, uh, provides quite a lot of extra guarantees that you might not expect at the beginning. Uh, for example, it's okay to have a, a, a name with an internal linkage in a, in a modular, in an importable header, provided that it's not used outside. So this, for example, allows us to use a technique such as the Schwartz counter that used in some implementations to initialize IOST, for, for, for instance. Okay, so this is include translation. Let's quickly run through our checklist and see what problems we've actually solved. Um, Compilation speed, I don't know about you, I'll take three times speed up for no changes in my source code. And as Gabby mentioned in his talk, uh, uh, header impartation or especially include translation is basically standardized and cleaned up pre-compiled uh, pre headers. Header source uh, split still stays, stays, right? Nothing changes there. Lack of isolation, well, some things have been taken care of. So because we, we uh, compile the header and com extract the BMI for a header independently of all the translation units that use it, um, our code can no longer change headers and headers can no longer change each other. And the, but the condition here is if translated. You know, if you have a code base which targets multiple platforms, sometimes you translate, sometimes you don't. So you obviously don't get this, any of this if you don't translate your headers. Or the other violations, um, this is actually an interesting part. Uh, it, it, it's again a mixed bag. So I think uh, identical definitions problem, and this is, by the way, uh, the, 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 the bad part, right? Or there are, of these two, this is the nasty one. So the good news is that headers, uh, header units um, include translation, header importation, take care of that. Um, single definition, uh, yeah, I don't want to go into much detail. It sounds like it, 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 it's going to be implementation defined. So I think overall, because we solved the nasty problem, I would say let's give it to include translation here, the imports, and say that, okay, they, they solved ODR violation. I'm saying that the second part is nasty. Is for, for ODR, the compiler is not required to issue diagnostics. And for the second one, you're actually not going to get anything. It, it, it's going to be most likely a runtime bug if you, if you uh, catch it. Uh, while the single one usually leads to a, to a linker error, such as duplicate symbol definition and so on. Okay, order dependency uh, is taken care of, again, if translated, right? 
because here there's a compiler independently, the order cannot, in order in which we include them can no longer affect the interface that we get. Uh, cycles still the, stay the same. Um, interfacing with C++ and even C is taken care of. So now uh, what can happen is we can compile a header, produce its BMI, uh, which is uh, uh, most likely is a lot easier to parse and understand than full C++ language. And then another language can use, consume this BMI to, to, to for example, call a function in C++. So I think this is a pretty big deal uh, going forward. Okay, so this is include translation in a nutshell. Um, I think pretty good news. Uh, some, most pro couple of problems solved, uh, basically for free. Okay, let's move to here the impartation. Well, the idea here is that instead of using this build system compiler magic to translate includes to imports, you just do it yourself, right? You replace include directives with import declarations. Here the name stays the same, nothing changes there. Um, so in this, in this level of modularization, uh, a consumer has to change. Here there still must be importable. Remaining includes are okay, um, but it probably makes sense. So you might have a third party library where you, 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 which you cannot change, right? And that's okay. Uh, the, the standard says that that should work somehow. Um, whether it will remains to be seen. Uh, but it still makes sense to probably set up include translation simply, simply because to take advantage of the BMI, right? You already have the BMI, might as well use it and, and get the speed up. Okay, here the impartation problem solved. Well, it's exactly the same as include translation that we've just discussed, except here we, we get rid of this if translated clause, right? You, you essentially translated your source code to here the impartation, that's the only way it can be now. Okay, modules proper. Um, so the slide is a little bit busy, uh, but I think it really helps to see everything in a, single, uh, in, in a single slide. Also for the record, this is not how I would pass my arguments in, in real uh, implementation of something like this. So this is like slide C++. Uh, so on the left, we have the header-based hello world example, right? We have a header, a source file. On the right, we have the modular implementation. Um, so we'll go, and at the bottom, we have the consumers in each case. So we'll go over it quickly, line by line. Um, and this repeats some of the, what you've seen probably at Gabby's talk. So the, a module, a module, a modular translation unit starts with a module declaration. So in this case, it's an exporting declaration. It's a module interface because there is an export keyword. Also notice that the, the name, hello in this case, it's actually, it's a language level identifier. It's not a preprocessor level something uh, token uh, that we have for headers, right? This quote and uh, angle bracketed. Here there's other funny, fuzzy thing that kind of there uh, without any well-defined meaning. So in case of a module, it's actually a language identifier, and we'll talk about module names in a bit. Um, then we have uh, includes for string, uh, std string and IS stream on, in the header-based implementation. Well, C++ 20 guarantees this will be importable, so you might as well go ahead and, and change them to import, right? No reason not to do it. A Couple of boilerplate um, header-related stuff, like pragma ones, include guards, inclusion of, of the header in the source file, all of this falls apart, is no longer necessary. Another key difference is that we, in a module, a module names that we want to see in, in our consumers, in those who consume the modules, they have to be explicitly exported. So this is a, a one of the fundamental differences compared to headers. But header, you get all the declarations there are, with module, you only get declarations that module author decided that has to be visible to you. So as you can see, we do it with an export declaration. Um, there's quite a lot of other ways to do it. You, know, you don't have to actually repeat export in front of actually, uh, uh, every declaration. We'll see some examples of that in a bit. Module consumer, again, we change include directive to, to import declaration. It looks pretty similar to header import, except here we use the actual module name instead of, um, instead of some uh, 
a hidden name thing. Okay, so this is these are headers in a uh, modules proper in a nutshell. So I think this is actually a good hello world example to test your compiler. Uh, I use that uh, quite a bit with different implementations. You know, it has some real modules, has, has some header units, and, and yeah, generally exposes bugs quite well. Oh yeah, uh, one, one more thing, and I think it keeps coming up. Uh, notice that the call to the function uh, hasn't changed. Uh, some people confuse modules and namespaces. So modules and namespaces are completely orthogonal concepts, in C++ at least. Uh, a module can export names from multiple namespaces, and the same namespace can span multiple modules. Right? So an and, and import uh, declaration does not imply any, anything like a, a, a namespace directive, you know, using namespace, hello, or anything. So in this case, we still have to qualify our name with a namespace. Okay, quickly going over uh, problems that we've solved. Uh, compilation speed, well, you probably can expect better than what headers. Uh, headers actually a pretty, there's quite a lot of additional uh, machinery and semantics to make things work, like merging modules. So I would naturally think that you will get even better performance with, with cleaned up proper modules where that is not required. Here the source file split is gone. As you can see, everything here is in a single file, but we can still split it, as we'll talk about uh, in, in a little bit. Uh, lack of isolation, all those issues are solved, right? Uh, and uh, the mechanism that allow us to solve it in modules are, first of all, that because they are completely is isolated, right? The, the interfaces are compiled independently of the consumers. And secondly, because of the explicit exportation of module interface, so we can no longer accidentally depend on, on the implementation details. ODR violations, again, all taken care of. Uh, I'm not gonna go again into too much detail here. Again, explicit exportation plus module linkage, which we'll mention in a little bit, so take care of all of this. Uh, there's no longer order on depend dependency order. So order of importation in uh, of, of modules is uh, irrelevant, it's insignificant. You can import them in any order, and modules explicitly do not support cycles. Right? And modules, again, allow us to interface with C++. And there's actually another interesting possibility. Uh, with, with modules, we now have this BMI, which is some sort of an, interf uh, uh, an interface representation that is not tied to understanding the entire language. So what we can do theoretically is create, create a cleaned up, uh, you know, new modern, postmodern, whatever you want to call it, C++. This actually can interface with old C++, well, old crafty C++ that we have via this BMI boundary, right? Which is something that we cannot do with here. So I think this is quite an intriguing possibility. We'll see where it leads. Okay, so this is the what and, and why section. So we. Uh, looked at what modules are, different levels. Let's now look at how. How do we apply some of that to in our code bases? We'll come up with a couple of guidelines. Well, first of all, we'll talk about a bit about module structure. And again, uh, this covers a little bit, has a bit of an overlap with Gabby's talk. Um, so here's our hello module from the previous slide. What if we want to include a non-modular uh, header? a non-importable header, like for example, assert, right, that we want to use in, in, our, in our implementation. Uh, in, in the old C++, we can include things, you know, in a translation unit in any order, right? In, in old, old C++ translation unit is just a bunch of declarations in any order, nobody cares. Uh, a module has a, 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 has a particular structure. So a module translation unit, module source card, code has specific structure. So the first part uh, of, a, of a module translation unit is an optional global module fragment. It starts with a module uh, semicolon uh, sequence. So I like to think of, about it like you are introducing of an unnamed module, which is a global module. Um, and the global module fragment, so this section uh, between the, the global module introducer and the module declaration is called global module fragment, and it can only contain uh, preprocessor directives. Like, you might wonder why. 
such a restriction. I think the main motivation is to allow tools to easily you know, extract module information. I don't actually think it helps anyone. So in particular, one thing that you cannot do in a global module fragment is provide, is, def, is, is have forward declarations, which I think is, is pretty unfortunate limitation. But yeah, the good news is that it should be easy to relax in a backwards compatible way. Okay, so after the global, mo global module fragment ends with a module a declaration, so in this case exporting, immediately after the global module fragment we have what is called a, a preamble, a module preamble. This is, the place, this is the place where we can place our imports, right? A module, uh, import declarations in a, in a modular translation unit must appear in the module preamble. And that, again, the restriction here is to allow tools to easily extract dependency information. I think this is a reasonable um, restriction because that's what we do anyway, or would do normally in anyway. And if you look typical translation unit that uses headers, we normally have a bunch of includes at the beginning and then we have our code at the end. So it kind of echoes what we are already doing. Um, the module preamble ends with the first non-import declaration and uh, starts a module purview. Now this is a, an, again another central part uh, of the module machinery. And module, per, if, if, it's an, if it's a module interface, you know, it's an exporting uh, module, it has an exporting module declaration, this is the place where we can export our names, right? And this is an example of how another way you can do it. Right? Instead of exporting each declaration, you can, for example, export uh, all declarations in, in the namespace wholesale. You just put export namespace and so on. If, if a name is not exported in, uh, that appears in a module per view, it is said to be owned by that module and have module linkage. So module linkage is another um, key part, um, though, but a bit low level part of a module machinery, and th that's what allows us to solve all those ODR violation problems. So the guarantee here is that a name with mo an identical name with module linkage will not clash with any other module or a global module fragment name. So we can have hello, if, if we did not export this uh, uh, say function, uh, we can have multiple such uh, names in the same hello namespace in multiple modules and even in the global module uh, uh, fragment uh, without having any, any clashes. Okay, so with this uh, understanding, who can tell me what's wrong with that? Right. So what we do here is we include std string in our module purview, which means that all the string uh, declarations, all the names are now owned by our hello module. And depending on the implementation, this code might actually even compile and run and work. So what, what you will end up with is code bloat, right? You will have the std string that, that's part of the global module fragment, and now you have your own module own std string copy of, 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 of everything, probably something you don't want to do. So the general guideline, this is our first guideline, is including headers in the, in the module purview is a bad idea. Right? There are probably exceptions, but I think the key point here, you need to, if, if you do something like that, you need to do it consciously, you need to understand why you're doing it. So yeah, I think, I don't know, I, I'm predicting here, but I think this will be one of the biggest ways to shoot yourself in the foot with modules. Okay, so let's not talk about interface and implementation units. So in our example, currently we have everything in a single file, and if you look at it, it has quite a lot of implementation details, right? If we want to quickly you know, scan this, um, this file to see what exactly the interface is, it's, it's littered with things that are irrelevant to this, to this goal, right? We have the header inclusion, we have IOS stream, both of them are only used in the implementation, and then we have the implementation itself, right? So if we don't like that, we can split our module into multiple translation units, so we have the module interface unit, which just uh, declares the, the interface, right? exports the interface. And then we have module, uh, uh, module implementation unit. And the, the key difference between the two is that one has an exporting module declaration while the, while the other has uh, you know, a, a non-exporting declaration. So th this is 
the main part. And the key point, and I think Gabby also mentioned in his talk, to keep in mind is that uh, all the declarations made in the module interface are implicitly visible in the module implementation unit. So, you know, with headers, we have a header, we usually, first thing we do in our source file, we include that header, right? With modules, we don't need to do that. That, that, that module, non-exporting module declaration implicitly imports the module interface. I think that's 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 nice little uh, convenience and clean up. Okay, so a couple of points about uh, interface and implementation units. Uh, we can still define non-inline functions and variables in our module interface. You know, if you have a simple function uh, which is easier to just show implementation than to document, why not? Um, we can have multiple implementation units, but only single primary. Um, module interface. Um, there are also partitions, two kinds. Gabby touched on the interface partitions. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, I think if when you're converting to modules and your life is not exciting enough, then look into partitions. It will make your life exciting. Okay, so uh, now we arrive to, to the big question, right? To split or not to split into different, uh, into several, into interface and implementation unit. And there's quite a lot of debate. There are very strong opinions on each side, usually on the pro side, you need to keep everything in a single file. Let's quickly go through pros and cons of each. Um, so the big pro for keeping everything in a single file is, of course, that we don't have to repeat ourselves. And, and I mean, we must all agree that that's, that's a, a very ap appealing thing, right? We also have the ability to create a module interface only libraries, which would be, um, you know, the equivalent of header-only libraries in header world. Um, and the extra benefit here is that now we can actually define non-inline functions and variables in our interfaces. So for those of you who, who like header-only libraries, there's only good news here. Uh, the couple of also drawbacks though, and they are but a bit more subtle and you only start realizing them once you start using things. And the main one is unnecessary compilation. So imagine you have the that the module interface that has an implementation, and you change something in the implementation, right? In fact, that will probably be the more common change that you make. Right? You, you don't change your interfaces as often as your implementation. So in this case, all the consumers of your module that only actually need the interface, right? They will be un recompiled unnecessarily. Now, the, um, those who argue strongly for for keeping everything in a single file, usually say, no, this is definitely an issue. This is a usability problem. The compiler and the build system, you know, need to do something about it and to solve this problem for us. Um, and it sounds reasonable on the surface, but the more we actually look into supporting something like this, the more we realize this is gonna be more challenging than, than we, we thought so for various implementation related reasons. The other problem with uh, keeping everything in a single file uh, especially if you have a bigger modules, is that uh, it's, it's hard to read, your, to understand what's going on there, right? If you again need to get some details about the interface, I think nobody will argue it's much easier to read the interface on the right than on the left, right? To understand what's going on. Uh, we also have unnecessary dependencies if we keep everything in the same file, well, for, for interface extraction at least. So in this case, again, iostream is only used in the implementation. But when we need to extract an interface for a module that contains everything in a single file, we have to wait for the BMI for iostream before we can, um, we can you know, produce the BMI for this module. So, and this is again, is, is unnecessary because the iostream is used purely in, in the implementation. So in the end, I think this will be a judgment call. I'll probably personally use both, you know, for simple, in, mostly inline template modules, I don't see why not keep everything in a single file for a heavier modules with more substantial implementation, non-inline implementation, I'll probably use multiple files. Okay, let's quickly uh, go over, um, discuss where modules fit in our uh, physical design mechanisms that are available in C++. So here we have a diagram that is probably most of them. Um, so we start with a package. What is a package? Most of us kind of either using already packages or wishing we were using packages. What is a package? It's kind of this fuzzy term. Um, I like to think of a package as a, as a versioning and dependency unit. 
And package can contain a library, can contain several libraries, maybe a library and executable pair, depends on which packaging you know, technology you're using. So further down, we have a library on an executable, uh, typical uh, building blocks of, of our physical structure. Uh, going further down, we, before modules, we had headers. I think it's pretty clear that here uh, modules are, are meant to replace headers, so it's only naturally to put them on the same uh, level in this diagram, so we now have headers and modules. Uh, going further down, we have namespaces, uh, and below namespace, we have names, basically the things that we actually shuffle using this physical and, and organize using this mechanism. So based on this uh, little diagram, let's quickly look at, um, at module granularity, right? How big or how small should we make our modules? Well, if, he, if modules are replacing headers, it's probably natural to, to use uh, header granularity as a baseline. And in fact, if you have you know, clean, nicely modular in the broader sense, code base, uh, converting it to modules, basically replacing header with a module wholesale is, is a reasonable choice. One thing to keep in mind is that unlike including a header, importing a module will, the cost of importing a module will be negligible. At least that's, that's the assumption. So this uh, probably means we should bias ourselves to bigger, chunkier modules. Um, some, some people suggest that module is the new library. Uh, I don't think I agree entirely with that, but for simple libraries which have a single purpose, single concern, I don't see why not having a single module for the entire library. I think going in the other direction is probably not a good idea. You don't want to uh, you know, have a, a module per class or module per function. Okay, a couple of pros and cons for going too big or too small. Uh, if, if our modules are, are very big and they contain unrelated subsystems or components, then we again end up with unnecessary compilation, right? Consumers that only use one part of a module and you modify another part of a module will be recompiled unnecessarily, right? If we go to small, and well, the other problem is they're hard to navigate. And if you have a, um, a, a, a large module with a large interface and related things, it's hard to uh, understand it. If we're going to small, we, the, problem, the main problem here is things get tedious, right? And we kind of already have that with headers. And you might have 20 headers in your translation unit and you're keeping track what you're using and not using. Maybe you have includes that are no longer necessary. So we definitely don't want to end up in that situation again. So I think the, uh, uh, the guideline we came up to with is to combine related and commonly used entities in, in, a, in a single module, which sounds like a generally good design, right? And also provide aggregate modules uh, for convenience. So, if, for example, if you have two sub-modules in your module, you might provide uh, a module that simply re-exports all of the names. Okay, naming things, right? The most difficult part uh, in our job. Uh, let's talk about module names. So a, mo a module name, according to the standard, is a dot-separated sequence of identifiers. Uh, they are on a separate name plane, meaning that they don't uh, clash with namespace names, function names, type names, and so on. Um, the standard does not yet prescribe any hierarchical semantics for modules, but that might change uh, in, in, in the future as we gain more experience and do some more thinking. Uh, so, again, going back to our uh, physical uh, composition diagram, let's see how, you know, everything fits together. How do we, how, I think the, the key idea here is to keep things consistent, right? You probably want to have, uh, you know, library name, and namespace name, and module names have some co common theme. So here I've added two options, library and executable. And we, I think it, it helps to start from the bottom, from namespaces, something that is, in a sense, below modules. Um, so in case of an executable, you know, some people like to still use namespaces, uh, some people don't. Uh, I think it's pretty reasonable. You know, no, no, but nobody else is gonna use your code for, for simple things. Um, I think it's perfectly reasonable to, to have no namespace there. Um, 
for library, we definitely want, I think it's fairly established uh, uh, good practice to have an overreaching namespace for your library, which probably corresponds to your library name. Like in this case, we have a library called deep hello, and the namespace would be hello. So if we're going up to modules, uh, I think it's pretty uh, natural to start your module name with uh, this overreaching namespace, if you have one, right? So these are the guidelines we came up with naming modules in our projects. Uh, we'll start uh, with library or project uh, dot namespace, if you have it. And we finish name, uh, the, the module name, you know, the second component or uh, a sequence of, of components at the end. We finish them with the, the, the describe the module's main functionality. If it is for a single entity or primary entity, for example, class, uh, then it makes sense to name it the same as a class. It just reduces the amount of thinking you need to do. And you also may want to provide aggregate modules that simply re-export some modules for convenience. Um, so this is quite just a quick example. I'm gonna skip over it very quickly. So this is an example of a library uh, that we modularized. It has the BUTL namespace, this overall namespace where everything lives. And this is some examples of the modules that we have. So as you can see, they all start with BUTL and um, at the end, you usually have the primary entity that they're responsible for. Okay, naming module files. So this is where things get contra controversial. Um, with headers, we kind of have a single name, right? So header name, it's kind of this fuzzy thing that standard doesn't really define very well. Uh, with modules, we, we now have proper names. Uh, and most of us, the standard again doesn't say that the module has to live in a file, but most of us will save our modules in files. So the question is now, how do we map module names to file names? Um, and the standard again is silent on that um, for various good reasons. But I think it probably not a controversial uh, idea that they should somehow be related. You know, they, they need to correspond. Uh, let's start with the easy part, in quotes, um, with file extension. So there's actually a, a debate going on whether we even need a separate extension for modules. And if we do, then do we need a separate extension for interfaces or also implementation units? Um, I strongly believe we need a separate extension for a different extension for uh, module interfaces for the same reasons that we have uh, different extensions for our headers, right? They are special. They define the interfaces to our things. So they need to be easily recognizable as such. So these are some commonly used uh, extensions in C++. And we, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think we will, it's realistic to expect that we'll agree on a, on a single extension. Um, so I think if we, if we agree that, we need, that it, it should be separate, it will already be a good start. So there's some suggestions uh, if you're using one of these naming schemes. But yeah, I think, as usual, we'll end up with a several different things of doing several different ways of doing things in C++. That's kind of how we roll, right? Okay, moving on to um, file, base name. Um, well, one, one way, one naming approach would be to simply repl replace dots in your module names with your favorite separator, be it a dash, underscore, maybe case change if you use camel case in your file naming schemes. So that on the left, we have an example of that. And um, I think it's a reasonable thing. Uh, pretty straightforward. I personally don't like it from an aesthetic point of view. You know, you have a hello already in your directory name, and you keep repeating, keep repeating this hello multiple times in, in your files. So in a sense, hello is already you know, part of the of the of the directory that contains your uh, source files. Uh, so on the right is is an alternative uh, scheme, and the guideline we came up with is to uh, embed a sufficient amount of the module name tail, right, the part at the end, to unambiguously distinguish modules within your project. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this uh, section because we are running a little bit of time. So the key point I want you to, do, to take, uh, and you can read more details on, 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 in the slide, is that you don't want to distribute BMIs. BMIs are not a distribution mechanism. They should not be installed. They should not be distributed. Distribute uh, header inter uh, module interfaces, similar how do we distribute headers. Okay, now we've arrived to our when part. Um, so 
when can we, can we start using modules in our code bases? Uh, which level, so the, the first question you want to answer is actually, which level do you want to go, right? Do you want to go to include translation, hit importation all the way to modules, you know, maybe you start with one and then move to another. Uh, working on build systems for the past decade taught me that uh, the projects and the context in which people use C++ are very, very different. There's, there's oftentimes very little common uh, intuition, I would say, between C++ developers. And uh, over time, I've came up to uh, classifying projects along two axes. The first one, whether it's a single platform or a cross-platform. And the second one, whether it's a, a reusable component, such as a library or end product, such as an ex executable. So if you intersect those, you end up with this uh, four, four cell matrix. So we're gonna, and, and the way you, you would go modularizing each of these types of projects is actually a bit different. Um, so we're gonna go over each of them and also provide some examples to give you an intuition what I'm talking about. So we're gonna start with a single platform and product. Um, an example would be, you know, a project in, inside your company proprietary that, you know, you're running on your servers. It's probably a single platform, specific compiler, specific version, specific standard, C++ standard you're using. So you're pretty, uh, you know, uniform there. Um, so in this case, all three options are available to you, again, provided your single target actually, sub your single compiler uh, supports that. I would say skip include translation simply be because you can do better, right? It's not difficult to replace include directives with uh, import declarations, basically search and replace thing. Um, and then you just remove one more thing to worry about setting up include translation in your build system and so on. Okay, so th this is the simple case. Now we have a single platform reusable. An example of that would be, again, you know, a proprietary library that is used inside your company, but it's used in multiple projects, maybe in different teams and so on. Uh, again, here, but you still have that same uniformity of having only a single compiler version standard and so on. Um, again, here, all three options are available. Uh, I would say here you, again, want to avoid include translation simply because uh, you know, you remove one more variability and one more thing for, for the users of your library to worry about. Uh, Cross-platform end product. Uh, an example of that would be something like an open source database. There's quite a lot of, you know, key value, no SQL databases these days. Quite a few of them are written in C++. So they, they are cross-platform. They usually have to target several different platforms, different compilers, um, but they, you don't use the, the source code in your applications directly, with the exception of maybe runtime library. Um, and here, by, with, uh, at this stage, with cross-platform, when, when I say cross-platform, I will assume that not all of the compilers' targets actually support modules. So we have to kind of deal with, with both kinds in the same code base. Um, I think at this stage, we would say it would be safe to say the only option available to use include translation uh, for those targets that support it. Probably easiest to set up, especially since you you control the build system that is used to build your end product. Um, here, the importation you can use preprocessor, you know, if modules available, import otherwise include. But I think it's just unnecessary complexity. Moving to cross-platform reusable. Uh, we have, again, here include translation is really your, realistically your only option. Everything else is, is a portability uh, problem, uh, except here, you know, the users of your library now are involved. So now they have to make sure that, you know, things are set up properly for, say, header impartation or module impartation. And talking about this last point, um, you might be tempted to provide a dual header uh, module interface, and the standard actually is very, the, the, the underlying uh, um, semantics of module is very carefully uh, specified to allow that, um, and you might want to do it, but we try to do that, it actually gets hairy very quickly, and I think if you have a choice, just say no, and if you want to see some gory details, um, there's a talk from 2017 that shows some examples. Okay, so uh, last uh, 
a couple of slides. Let's not talk about when we can start uh, modularizing our code. What's the state of the standard, state of the build systems, and state of the compilers? So we'll start with the standard. So modules are in C++ 20. So we, have mod we will have modules in C++ 20. Uh, standard library headers uh, will be importable. So you'll be able to repl replace include std string and so on with import declarations. Uh, the, one of the goals for C++23 that is proposed is to uh, modularize standard library. And I think that would be, uh, I would be very surprised if that does not happen. Uh, it feels very natural. Uh, system headers, well, that's up to the implementation. So we'll, let's basically see how it goes. Compilers, uh, as Gabby mentioned, all three major compilers, Clang, MSVC, and GCC, are uh, busy implementing modules. So it's still not complete. Uh, and there's various levels of completion. There's still bugs, especially in the header impartation machinery. And that's not, not, not surprising. If you look in the standard, there's quite a lot of extra semantics and mechanics uh, there for header unit impartation that is uh, you know, pre pretty difficult to get right. Uh, you can probably uh, hear more about that at Nathan's talk. Um, also, the, the other part that is uh, somewhat lacking in the compilers is support for build systems, some things like dependency extraction and um, module mapping support and so on. So this is all work in progress. But when it comes to build systems, again, um, uh, still work in progress. So in build two, we have support for modules for three compilers, for header units and include translation only for GCC currently. Um, last time I spoke to CMake folks at, at the Calon standards meeting, uh, the, they, they were working on, on supporting modules. I don't think they have looked into header units or include translation yet. Um, uh, Mason, I've asked the author to see there. Um, he said that they're still in the wait and see uh, state. Auto tools, I personally believe unlikely anytime soon, simply because it's a very antiquated build system. IDEs are also working. Um, I, I'm, I know that major IDEs are busy looking into supporting modules. And that includes both for building things, if they have a build system inside, as well as for syntax highlighting and so on. Okay, um, two minutes to spare. All right, that's, that's it. So if you want to look into some, uh, read more about some uh, details, build system related de details. There's uh, a whole chapter in the build to manual on, on module support. Like someone asked Gabby yesterday about symbol exporting on Windows. Yeah, there's some actually exciting things that we can do about it in there. So there's some details there. Also some areas that I haven't covered. Uh, if you are, when you are looking to modules, make sure you go and read up on that. I think it's all kind of key parts of, 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 of using modules. And that's it. Any questions? And please use the mic. Is there time for a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned forward declarations. Can you go into more detail there? Like, how would I forward declare something in my module interface? Well, that's a good point. So the, the, the only way for you to actually forward declare things is to put them in a separate header. But the, another thing to keep in mind is that modules will probably make most forward declarations unnecessary. The, re the main reason why we do forward declarations, aside from cycles and so on, is because including headers is expensive, right? And with modules, importing a module is presumably will be very cheap. So you, you probably will not need most of the time. Just so I understand, the include translation tech, it sounds like that's more of a build technique than something we've gotten from modules. I mean, why couldn't we just do that with the conventions we have today, which is build system just says, that's a header, I've seen it before, I'll just pre-compile something and then make it available to the rest of the build system. Or is there something that's changed that makes that more possible now with modules? Well, I think the include translation Translation is based on header impartation. So that's the under, under underlying technology, right? With header impartation, you can go and replace include directive with the import uh, declaration in your source code. 
include translation is probably is just a way for you not to modify your source code. So. All right. Would you mind going back to a slide that had main.cpp on it? This one? Uh, main. Okay. There. So I notice uh, main is just importing hello. It does not import string, uh, yet we're calling a function that takes a string mm -hmm. and the, the literal is being automatically converted. Right. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the rules that make that possible. Um, yeah, I skipped over that. So. Uh, and I mentioned that one of the points at, on the last slide. So this is reachability versus um, visibility uh, distinction in modules. I think if you want to see a, a talk on that that goes into detail, watch Bryce's talk at Core CPP. It, 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 it talks about that, that in quite a bit of detail. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, yeah, I think we are done. Thank you.